Hi, in this presentation, we're going to talk about the use of picture books and graphic novels to improve the reading and writing skills of your students. This is geared toward K through 12, but I'm going to also emphasize the use of graphic novels for middle school and secondary school students. Some terms, when I use the term picture book, I'm referring to oftentimes big books or uh, even smaller books for young children that um, put in a heavy emphasis on the pictures, on the artwork in visually attractive ways that can be used with early readers. Graphic novels are in comic form, but they are also often very sophisticated. They contain complex themes that are appropriate for young adult literature. And so graphic novels can be used in beneficial ways for your middle and secondary students. Now, importantly to recognize, this also is very beneficial for engagement, for motivation, and for second language learners as you start to emphasize the language conversation about the language in ways that are motivational and engaging. If you're working with younger children, you can use picture books, big books uh, to emphasize a book part. Um, the print, the genre study, uh, the elements of a good book, but even within a graphic novel, a good graphic novel, if it has a good sound plot, good character development, um, a story arc uh, with the traditional story arc with tension development, and perhaps it has a really rich theme, uh, then you can use that for a good genre study in a graphic novel too. I want you to know what visual literacy is because you can use picture books as well as graphic novels to develop a student's uh, visual literacy, which is the ability to understand, interpret, and appreciate the meaning of visual messages as well as communicate effectively and produce visual messages using basic principles and concepts of visual design. Now to slow down a little bit, um, when we talk about interpretation and understanding that that's what Rosenblatt, Louise Rosenblatt, uh, drawing on transactional approach to reading, would call the efferent um, understanding, the efferent approach to reading. When we talk about appreciation, that's the aesthetic approach to reading. And the transactional approach to reading would tell us that we need both the efferent as well as aesthetic uh, to help us make meaning. We also know that positive emotions, um, enjoyment can enhance comprehension and motivation and engagement uh, for students as they are getting into a text. We also know that from uh, theories like dual coding theory, when you study that, that when you are paying attention, uh, heightened attention, focused attention to art, to pictures on a page, and then you turn that attention over to text, uh, the language, then that heightened attention helps you to comprehend text in an enhanced way. Attention makes a major difference here. Now you want to be, of course, careful when you're choosing which book you use that you not, are not overloading, that the book is well designed so that the pictures, the artwork don't uh, create a type of confusion, cognitive overload for the student. You want a well-designed book that doesn't send the student into cognitive overload uh, to where it's the equivalent of a paper bag bursting. We can, with young children, use picture books to study parts of book that cover the end papers, uh, the front type of, of placement of the book. Now, again, with young children, uh, picture books, big books are very valuable for helping them learn uh, book parts. For older children with graphic novels, that's likely not necessarily as important, although things like aspects of narrative um, and theme can be studied with a good graphic novel. 
uh, you can use these to teach reading and language art skills, comprehension, um, understanding in a meaningful way with young children, concepts of print, the idea that these little jottings on a page have meaning even before the young children have the ability to read. Are children able to read with appropriate pace and tone? Uh, do they understand uh, different types of genres that are available? And you can study the way these genres are put into action. Are they able to work with uh, grammar conventions? Um, can they understand different parts of book? Are they able to break words into different components and put them back together in sensible ways? Are they able to break words and sounds of words down into smallest parts and make meaning of these? Are they able to make use of vocabulary in a meaningful and useful way? And then when we talk about young children with picture books, we can work with the stages of early literacy development. Um, first, uh, children might start with very beginning um, talking and babbling and uh, fiddling around with language and making sense of the idea that language, these sounds have meaning. Then eventually we go into introducing children to books and other forms of text and children will develop concepts of print, the understanding that these jottings on a page have meaning. Um, even if they're not able to read these jottings on the page, they can at least run their finger, for instance, along the print in a book, and, and they might do some pretend reading during the emergent stage. Um, even if they don't have the slightest idea how to actually read, they might even make up a very creative and imaginative story for you as they're doing pretend reading. The emergent literacy stage is very, very important for young children. Then we get into, of course, the beginning reading stages. That's when children are just beginning to learn how to make sense out of the text on the page, and they need freedom to uh, be uh, guided, freedom to take risks without being scolded and belittled every time they might get something wrong. You've got to patiently guide a student into eventually almost becoming fluent in their reading and writing until eventually they can read and write with appropriate pace and tone. We have the five essential components of effective reading that we'll get into right now. Phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. Importantly here, um, I want you to think about what are in the field called constrained versus unconstrained skills. Uh, when we talk about phonemic awareness, phonics, once a child has mastered these skills, uh, it hits a plateau to where you don't have, um, they're not going to continue to show skyrocketing gains in these areas if you continue to test them over time. Uh, fluency, generally speaking, is constrained too. Once you are a fluent reader, you're not going to show um, tremendous gains in your fluency if you continue to take fluency tests over time. Uh, but vocabulary and comprehension, those are unconstrained skills. You're going to continue to build your vocabulary over the course of your lifetime. And if you continue to test um, a student, even in middle school and secondary school, on vocabulary, um, hopefully you're going to show increasing vocabulary gains over time with comprehension you are capable of reading increasingly complex texts over time. A high school reader should be able to read increasingly more complex texts than they were able to read in middle school. Even for adults, um, when I started graduate school, um, I started tackling increasingly complex texts uh, that I might not have been reading let's say seven years, eight years before I started graduate school. Uh, there is um, 
an art as well as a skill to reading uh, research articles, especially research articles containing statistics or picking up a physics journal. If you go outside of my field, picking up a, fi a, a journal in the physics field and being able to comprehend what's being written in one of these physics journals, that goes toward ongoing literacy and ongoing comprehension that even adults are doing. Too many times we think of comprehension as something that, oh, that child has mastered comprehension. No, it's ongoing. It's an ongoing growth. We all are continuing to grow. Um, now, we get into an area of possible mistake. If a student is struggling with comprehension, but you misdiagnose and you think that the reason the child is struggling with comprehension is phonics, but in fact, that child has mastered phonics for that particular language. Now, granted, mastering phonics can vary depending on whether you're talking about first language or second language. When we're talking about English language learners, you might have mastery of phonics in your home language, but I still be working on phonics for English if you're a second language learner. It's, but it's important uh, to recognize and diagnose exactly what is causing difficulty for a struggling reader. Because a, str a student who is struggling for, with comprehension because of vocabulary will get very bored and upset if you are skilling and drilling um, him or her on phonics. When in fact that student might have already mastered phonics and that student might feel insulted. Um, on the other hand, if that student is in fact struggling with phonics and the struggle with phonics is causing difficulty in comprehension, but you don't recognize that the struggle is because of phonics, and so you're working with vocabulary instead of phonics. Now, Houston, we've got another reverse problem. You're tackling the wrong problem. And so it is very important to recognize um, what the source of a reading difficulty is and address that source uh, where the root cause is at. When we talk about phonemic awareness, that's commonly defined as the understanding that spoken words are made of separate units of sound that are blended together when words are pronounced. Um, phonemic awareness is something that young children uh, need to work with. Obviously, for middle and secondary students, they would already master phonemic awareness. But uh, picture books and the modeling of picture books and reading out loud to young children and talking with children um, are all very important aspects of helping a child develop phonemic awareness. Phonics, a set of rules that specify the relationship between letters in the spelling of words and the sounds of spoken words. Now, uh, you can have different uh, approaches to teaching and understanding phonics. In another lesson that I'm going to give you, you will learn that there are different approaches to reading instruction. Some approaches to reading instruction, which I'm going to call bottom-up approaches, will emphasize phonemic awareness, phonics, in a bottom-up approach, and it's phonics first. And so there is an emphasis on making sure that children understand word parts, study the word parts, um, gain a strong, strong, strong understanding of phonics. Um, and they and over time, this will lead toward exercises in comprehension. Now, that's the bottom up approach. You find that favored in if you've ever heard of the company called Hooked on Phonics, that's favored there. If you've ever heard of the Orton Gillingham approach, uh, that's popular within the dyslexic community, dyslexia community, uh, that's favored. If you've heard of the science of reading movement, that is becoming very popular. Now, when I talk about the science of reading movement, I'm talking about a, a certain exact movement that's afoot. I'm not talking about everything in the field of, of literacy research that is research-based. That's a different topic. But the particular movement that we call science of reading movement that is supported by um, largely the dyslexia community and some cognitive scientists 
um, and others. And it's become very popular in the state legislature level and in Arkansas, for instance, it's, it's extremely popular. Uh, for those of you who are in Missouri, as I make this recording on this science of reading movement has not yet um, become a dominant factor in K through 12 schools, but I'm predicting that within the next two or three years, it probably will. Um, the science of reading movement is sweeping across uh, the United States. Um, and there are some people that agree with the movement, some people who disagree with the movement. It depends on whether we're talking about a bottom up or um, top down approach. When I talk about a top down approach, top down approaches focus on the comprehension first, the meaning, the sound of words, the playing with words, the whole language, if you've heard that term before, of, of the words. And then as the child gains comprehension, and enjoyment and motivation and the music of the language, if you will, then we use that toward going toward phonics. So it's top down, it's whole to part. Um, that's what the whole language people um, get into. So again, um, phonics first believes that you teach the rules of phonics as a priority first, work your way toward comprehension. The whole language, hold apart, uh, believes you start with the comprehension first, the meaning first, and you work your way down toward, uh, toward phonics. And these schools of thought have a tendency to be at each other's throats when it comes to English language learning. English language learners, it has a strong emphasis. If you're helping a child uh, learn English as a second language, the science of reading approach, phonics first approach, would uh, say that you focus on the phonics first of the, uh, of the second language of English as you work with second language learners. The whole language approach would say, no, let's focus on the enjoyment, the music, the poetry, the sounds, words, the conversations, the meaning, the comprehension, and we use that um, toward, in a meaningful, constructive way, working our way toward also phonics. Uh, and so you can see that the way you would approach English language learners would differ depending on which school of thought you use uh, to, in, uh, to inform your approach. If you're in Arkansas in the K through 12 system um, in a public school, you're very likely to be in a phonics first approach. Um, but that would very likely uh, be um, encouraged, strongly encouraged by the state and the district. So then we get into fluency. Uh, fluency, the recognizing the words in a text rapidly and accurately and using phrasing and emphasis in a way that makes what is read sound like spoken language. Um, if you are listening to a fluent reader, then the word should come across smoothly and appropriately in an appropriate pace and tone. A disfluent reader, of course, will start to struggle, start to stumble on words. Um, they might read it too fast or too slow. So when you see the word rapidly, that's a generally accepted word, but I want to highlight here, actually, I prefer the word at an appropriate pace rather than rapidity, because too often, the word, when we emphasize rapidness, what we start to do is we start to train students to think that to be a good reader means to read fast. No, to be a good reader includes reading at an appropriate pace and an appropriate tone for that particular text that is being read. There are some circumstances where, yes, reading the word a little bit faster, depending on the context and the situation, uh, might be appropriate um, for the sake of storytelling. Other times, slowing down might be appropriate. That's where context matter, and that's where you can see a link up between fluency and comprehension. Fluency is not the same thing as comprehension. But if you understand context, it helps you to read appropriately at the appropriate pace. Vocabulary. 
words uh, we need to know to communicate with others. Um, there are generally speaking four types of vocabulary here. The listening vocabulary, speaking vocabulary, reading and writing vocabulary. Sometimes the students will um, understand vocabulary in the listening context, but when they actually start to read a word, they might struggle with that same word um, on a page, and they or they might struggle to write that word. So just because you understand words in conversation and listening and speaking doesn't necessarily mean that when you transfer it to the text, you've got it. And so what that means is that as we're working with vocabulary, we need to make sure that eventually a student doesn't really truly have a word until they have it in the listening, speaking, reading, and writing sense, which should tell you that it's important when you're working with students on vocabulary to include listening, speaking, reading, and writing in your instruction. Um, because I, sometimes the reverse might be true from what I was just saying. Sometimes a student might be able to understand a word in the reading sense, but in conversational writing with a native speaker, if they're an English language learner, that same word might be a struggle. Um, so it's very important to keep all of these in mind. That's very similar uh, to the difference that English language learners will encounter between academic vocabulary and conversational vocabulary. Sometimes, um, well, in fact, pretty much always, the academic vocabulary will run uh, behind the everyday common vocabulary. Yeah we get into comprehension. And um, ultimately, comprehension is the goal of reading. Uh, because remember, vocabulary, fluency, phonics, phonemic awareness, none of these things are the same thing as comprehension. You can understand a bunch of words without being able to understand a text, possibly, in context. Uh, you can read fluently, but lack comprehension of the text. The ultimate goal is to put all of this stuff together and reach comprehension, Con which means, again, constructing meaning that is reasonable and accurate by connecting what has been read to what the reader already knows, prior knowledge, and thinking about all of this information until it is understood in a meaningful, useful way. Comprehension is the final goal of reading instruction. Um, so when we think about comprehension, it's important to think about things like making connections to prior knowledge, social context, meaningfulness, uh, putting um, reading strategies together, all of this goes in. Comprehension is a very complex process. Then we get into the six language arts, which should also not be taught in isolation. Remember, you need to help students make connections. The six language arts here are listening, speaking, reading, writing, viewing, visually representing. Too often in classrooms, we neglect these things. For instance, the listening. Listening is a skill. Um, listening is an art as well, and listening takes practice. Hon honestly, I believe that one of the struggles in our classrooms, as well as for that matter in society, is that many of us are not good listeners. Um, that's a trouble in relationships, for that matter. Um, you know, so lis uh, listening in a receptive and respectful way and being patient, not interrupting each other. Uh, that's an important skill within your, uh, within your classroom that you can work with students on. Visually representing the drawing. Um, when it comes to uh, digital technologies, we can use the visually rep uh, representing things um, in digital ways. Too many times we neglect visual representing of things and we might even scold students if we see students um, sketching on their paper, drawing. Some students love to draw and we discourage that. What I say is we need to integrate each of these six language arts 
together in ways that are meaningful and useful for students to help them make meaning of fluency, vocabulary, comprehension in useful, meaningful ways. Listening, of course, we talk about understanding spoken language, communicating ideas through oral language, understanding written language, communicating through written language, understanding visual images, and connecting them to a company's spoken or written words. When we talk about the digital technologies, uh, the viewing uh, becomes very important. Visually representing, presenting information through images, either alone or along with spoken and written words. When we talk about digital storytelling, uh, telling um, a story using digital technology, oftentimes visual representing can be used in very creative ways. And then we have for language systems, all of these can be benefited and used in constructive ways with graphic novels or with picture books. Phonological system, syntactic system, semantic system, and the pragmatic system. Um, I would argue that it's also just as it's important to integrate the six language arts together, the four language systems also need to be integrated together within your curriculum and instruction in useful and meaningful ways. Too many times, for instance, we will teach these things separately from one another and not help students make connections. Now, I will say, and I'll pause here, is that as we go through the definitions of these different systems, keep in mind that this gets into one area of controversy between the part to whole people, phonics first people, and the whole to part people, bottom up versus top down, uh, because a criticism uh, that the whole language Part, um, hold apart people will level at the phonics first approach is that we're using these four language systems in isolation from one another instead of combination. And what the whole language people argue is that it's very important to uh, use all four of these language systems in connection with each other. Now, the argument back from the part to whole, the phonics first people, would be, okay, but aren't you taking the risk of potentially confusing students if you're overloading students with too much at once? And what I'm saying to you, and I hope you don't take all of this as confusion or what should I uh, decide, because I do have my particular stands that I take, and if you were to read um, some of my published work or talk to me away from this video where I'm a little bit more casual about what I believe and where my stances are. I do have my particular home base uh, when it comes to my theoretical views on reading. Uh, most of you guys uh, who have had me or talk with me, I, you probably already know Eileen very Vygotskyan, for instance. Um, and I draw on David Pearson's approach to literacy instruction, which is um, an approach that says, okay, each of these conflicting schools of thought actually have legitimate points that they're making. Um, but I don't believe that in this video and in my overall instruction, it's my role to, at the risk of using an awkward word that's sometimes used in other contexts also, indoctrinate you into one approach or the other. Um, it's okay if you take a part to whole approach. It's okay if you take a whole to part approach. I just want you to be an excellent teacher. And there are excellent teachers out there that take either one of those approaches or something that combines uh, those approaches. Uh, Pearson would tend to combine uh, those approaches when you look at the work of David Pearson in the reading field. Uh, but what I would say is that it's important to understand the debate between part to whole and whole to part. Um, and it's important to understand these different approaches to literacy, whether you're teaching students only in English or you're teaching English language learners, it's very important 
uh, to understand these debates in the field and why you are consciously using a whole to part or, or a whole or a part to whole approach. Understand the strengths as well as the potential weaknesses of each approach. When we talk about the phonological system, phonological system is often called the sound system of language. An easy way to remember that it sounds like phone, right? The sound of a telephone. Syntactic system. The syntactic system of language relates to the structure of a language. How is language put together? Um, and notice what I'm saying in terms of putting things together. If you work, you, it's possible to skill and drill a student on sounds, but if they're, but if they're missing the structure, they'll still struggle. Students need eventually all of these parts. If you're teaching English language learners, they need the sound because sometimes the sound system, uh, the phonological, will be very different or similar depending on which language we're, talk we're talking about when we talk about phonological system. In the English language, uh, the way that we pronounce words does matter. At the same time, there's a great deal of flexibility. If an English speaker, uh, for instance, hears me uh, pronounce the word baseball or baseball or baseball, they understand same word, depending on the, the tone or which one I stressed, which syllable I stressed, uh, doesn't necessarily make that big of a difference in terms of meaning of the word. Um, on the other hand, and generally speaking, there are exceptions. There's always exceptions with language. But on the other hand, you get into some language systems where which syllable you stress makes all of the difference and which tone you stress makes a major difference. Um, if you were to study Mandarin and the, and the four tonal systems in Mandarin, you use um, the same spelled word with one tone versus another tone, and it completely changes the meaning potentially. Syntactic, we get into the structure of language. Students need to understand how language is put together. They need to understand that there is a systematic structure. When we work with English language learners, the structure of a language might be very different from one language to the another. Now, of course, if you're teaching Spanish, um, there is a great deal of similarity, but there are some, when we get into the nitty bitty, uh, there are some differences, of course, within the structure too. So this gets into an area of careful work for you. Then we get into semantic system. Semantic system is sometimes referred to as the meaning system. It emphasizes the meaning of speech. Semantic system tends to be very strongly emphasized by the whole apart people. Um, the whole language uh, people emphasize meaning. And this gets into, of course, context. Um, Oftentimes, meaning of words and meanings of sentences can vary a great deal depending on social context. And so, with English language learners, that can be a significant area of difficulty, understanding why a word means one thing in one context, but another thing in a different context. Why a sentence used might mean one thing in one context, but a very different thing in a different context. And then we get into the pragmatic system, deals with the practical everyday uses of language. And the pragmatic system can be difficult for young children off by the time that we're middle schoolers and high schoolers or even adults if we're English only learners. We probably take the pragmatic system for granted. 
Um, but when you're looking at English language learners, the pragmatic system, the practical use of language can be a struggle. And you need to be patient with English language learners because this deals with culture, it deals with social settings, it deals with background knowledge, it deals with prior experience. If a person, and I'm using the term person to emphasize that the pragmatic system is an ongoing potential area of struggle even for adults um, whose first language is not English. Um, if a person has grown up um, in a different country, uh, sorry about that. If a person has grown up in a different country um, with different settings and different situations um, that lack a social context that United States people might take for granted, uh, sometimes that can be very difficult. For instance, if a person we tend to use a lot of sports metaphors here in the United States. Um, even if you don't follow sports, even if you're not a sports fan, you might not even think about just exactly how many sports metaphors are interwoven in there. Um, and someone who did not grow up with the same sports um, will hear you use a sports metaphor um, and need to have that explained. Um, and then we might unintentionally give that person a rude look or why don't you understand that or look at that person like they're dumb don't do that please it's not a matter of intelligence it's just lack of familiarity with that sport and now when we look at books by age um this is more for your beginning readers i'm not going to go over this uh slide that you see in front of you for one thing, because I'm assuming that I'm making this presentation primarily for middle and secondary readers here at UA Little Rock, um, the classes that I'm teaching are primarily um, middle and secondary. The majority of my classes um, are graduate school, um, middle uh, for master's and doctoral students. Uh, and so I'm assuming that this emphasis on grade level and age level is not necessarily going to be uh, useful for you. But if you are a uh, teacher of young children, then please go over this. Okay, we get into why is it important to read um, nonfiction and informational books to young children as well as to preteens and even adults. We talk about accuracy, interest, um, curiosity, models. You're able to model the way to read effectively as you're reading this book. It can prompt desire. It can prompt motivation. It gives you opportunities to model what it means to good uh, to do good reading. You can get into conversation about vocabulary and prior knowledge and misconception. There's, there's so many rich ways in which you can use it. And pleasure is also something that we should not uh, take for granted. That's for children as well as for um, young, your young adults at the high school level. Um, the desire, the repertoire, the visual representation, seeing themselves in a book, seeing experiences in the book, um, the way that well done pictures can bring a story to life. All of that is very important to not neglect in the books that you choose. And you can use picture books as well as graphic novels to inspire writing. Um, they can be, for instance, for instance, mentor books or mentor texts uh, as you are doing a writing workshop uh, to guide students in their um, writing of character development, setting problems, um, the story plot uh, for, uh, for young children or for um, young adults. And I'm not going to go over the wiki sticks uh, too greatly, but I will uh, use this for, um, for the slide I'm including in there. What I would encourage you to do is, and you can easily just Google um, picture books and wiki sticks if you want examples on YouTube for how to do that. Um, but I would encourage you to use um, 
hands-on things like wiki sticks, whether it's with children or even for your middle schoolers, or schoolers and high school students. Uh, be creative, be imaginative, allow for hands-on instruction um, because this builds, it's multi-sensory. The multi-sensory builds comprehension, it builds motivation, it builds engagement and fun. Don't be afraid to let learning be fun. And that note, I think that's a good way to end. Have a good day.